Now for today's program. Eric Alterman is a CUNY Distinguished Professor of English at Brooklyn College. He is also a contributing writer to The Nation and The American Prospect, and has been a columnist for Rolling Stone, Mother Jones, The Guardian, The Daily Beast, The Forward, Moment, as well as The Sunday Express in London. Eric is the author of 12 books, including the national bestseller, What Liberal Media? The Truth About Bias and the News. He has won the George Orwell Prize, the Stephen Crane Literary Award, and he won the Mirror Award for Media Criticism two times. Eric's latest book is We Are Not One, A History of America's Fight Over Israel. Joining Eric today is Moment contributor Dan Raviv. Dan was a CBS News correspondent in Israel, Europe, and Washington for 40 years, and then senior DC correspondent for Israel's I-24 News. Dan is the author of books about Israeli espionage and diplomacy, including Spies Against Armageddon and Every Spy a Prince. Please welcome Eric Alterman and Dan Raviv. Suzanne, thanks so much. And Eric Alterman, thank you for uh, joining us and congratulations on We Are One, your new book. We are not one. We are not one is the correct title. Thank you for reminding me because <laughs> that was a test. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, <laughs> you know your title, but let's talk about what does it even mean? Because Suzanne said that it's a history of America's fight over Israel, the debates within the United States over Israel. Friends were asking me, "What's this book about?" When they saw it in my home, and I said, "To me, it's a history of American Jews falling out of love with Israel." over the years. Uh, comment, we are not one, what does it mean? Well, first of all, I would say your reading of the book is, is a perfectly legitimate reading of the book. It's in the book, that story, but that's not how I see what the book is about. I mean, it certainly wasn't what I saw it was about when I began writing it. Um, the t I like the title uh, because it has multiple implications. I see three of them being the primary ones. Uh, the first one, which ought to be obvious, but isn't, is the United States and Israel are not one. Um, there are an awful lot of uh, people, in, in, particularly in Washington, and some in Jerusalem, who would say that Israel and the United States have identical interests in the world, and that whatever Israel does, the United States should support it, period. Um, and yet that's ridiculous, because uh, how can a small a tiny little country surrounded by uh, unfriendly countries in the Middle East have this exact same interest in the world as a global superpower surrounded by Canada and Mexico and oceans. Um, but nevertheless, that argument is quite frequently made that the United States owes, uh, because Israel and the United States quote unquote share values or share interests that they, they ought to act as one. So that's not true. The second, we are not one, refers to American Jews and Israeli Jews. Um, uh, they're very different. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they started out very different, but they've grown even more different over time. Uh, Israel is the only uh, putative democracy in the world that prefers Donald Trump to Joe Biden or Barack Obama. Um, and it's getting, uh, it's young people are more right-wing than their parents and their grandparents. The United States, American Jews are the opposite. Uh, Israel is a red country, American Jewry is a blue country and getting bluer. Yeah, and in your so, book, you uh, in your book you said I know opinion polls indicating that uh, something like ninety percent of Israeli Jews seem to agree with what we think of as conservative policies, uh, but in the U.S., American Jews tend to be liberals more than seventy percent. Right, exactly, and, and getting more so. Um, and third, uh, the we are now one refers to American Jews because American Jews are so deeply divided. Um, somewhat on politics generally, because although uh, only about a quarter of American Jews are conservative, they, they punch way above their weight in terms of politics, in part because a lot of them are wealthy, and in part because uh, APAC is quite conservative, and that's traditionally been the arm of American, uh, uh, American Jewish political action, um, but also because of Israel. So just lately with the new government, there's been a lot of attention from rabbis saying, I no longer can avoid talking about Israel in, in synagogue. But until recently, uh, well, actually, beginning, I don't, know, I don't know when I'd say it began, but right up until this past election, uh, rabbis didn't talk about Israel in their sermons in the United States. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about 
secular um, synagogues, not orthodox synagogues, because Israel had become so div so divisive. They, could, they couldn't say anything that would satisfy people and people got so angry about it. Um, so they just avoided it. And now, now they're finding they can't avoid it. But um, which leads me, by the way, to another reason that I like to talk about when I begin to talk about this book. Sometimes the first question is why the title and the second question is why did you write the book? And so I'm gonna answer that even if you didn't, don't ask it. And the answer is uh, two, threefold. First of all, I wrote it because I needed to write it personally. I actually began it 40 years ago at college and I saved my notes, I'm that much of a nerd. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I wrote it in, in, in terms of why I think it was worthwhile to write if you're not me or read if you're not me, are, are two reasons. One is everything having to do with Israel and particularly Israel and the Palestinians is very complicated. And it requires a lot of, a lot of the devil is in the detail and the details are important and they usually get glossed over in uh, news reports. And so in, in order to discuss how we get the, the debate wrong, I needed to get the events right and show the difference between the debates. And that takes a long time. That's why the book is 512 pages. Uh, let um, me take a moment to, by the way, give you high marks for including just about every incident that I remember in American politics that touches upon Israel, whether it's Secretary of State James Baker's annoyance at Prime Minister Shamir, or of course Netanyahu's speech to Congress where only Republicans invited him uh, to try to convince America not to proceed with an Iran nuclear deal. I mean, just so many, but they're, they're all here but when you put them all together, obviously you, Eric Alterman, can create a pattern and a trend. Yeah, thank you. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll give you back the floor, or, so to speak, is that um, the, I, 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 at some point in my life, I made, a, I made a vow, and I've mostly kept to it, that I would not discuss Israel and the Palestinians with anyone in person. Because unless two people share exactly the same assumptions, wow. Uh, they don't never does anyone really convince anybody to change their mind. They just end up getting mad at one another because the issue is not one of intellectual or policy. It's one of identity. It's always been one of identity. Well, at least since 1967 for American Jews, and it's increasingly become one for for anti-Zionists as well. So, um, you know, I, I gave up trying to respond when people say, what about this? What about that? It's, it's It becomes a battle of what I call whataboutism. And hence, I, I wanted to lay out what I see to be the evidence for either side. And, and even though um, I keep saying this, I don't expect anyone to agree with everything in the book. I think it's valuable to people on, on any side of the argument because it, it's, as you were good enough to say, it's mostly all there. Well, yes, it's pretty much all there, though, of course, interspersed with your personal take on where it fits into the history that you're dealing with, and also where Eric Alterman, you know, where you place it and what you, what you think about it. I mean, after all, you're taking, you know, well, you're, you're adding negative comments, of course, about Netanyahu quite a bit. Um, and uh, let's say Michael Oren, who was Netanyahu's ambassador here, Oh, about 15 years ago, um, you know, Oren then wrote about it, wrote a book, and he said there shouldn't be any daylight between the U.S. and Israel. And, and he tried, I think, uh, what you're referring to as uh, the dime store psychology. Michael Oren tried to explain Obama and tried to explain why U.S. Jews don't like Netanyahu because they're not comfortable with being Jews. You got it. So you gave your you're giving your personal you're holding our hands through the history. It's your take, and, and I just want to say this, it fits in with what I see as an overall message in We Are Not One that says, feel free to have an opinion. Just because you're an American Jew doesn't mean you have to agree with the Israeli government currently in power. Feel free to differ. Um, I feel, I mean, you, you may be right. I was trying to do something else. Mm -hmm. I was trying to write this book as a historian. And I was trying to say, uh, you know, I was trying to say, it doesn't matter what I think about this issue. What matters is here is the argument and here is the evidence. And it's true that personally, I don't like Bibi Netanyahu. And I think that Michael Oren engaged in some old fashioned Zionist anti-Semitism that one often sees among Israelis directed toward American Jews. Uh, 
anti-Semitism is not exactly the right word, but the, manipul- the, the use of anti-Semitic myths that Israeli Zionism addresses towards American Jews, towards the diaspora generally, the contempt for the diaspora. But um, I, I tried to lay out in each case the evidence for the argument I was making. I, I tried not to have an opinion. I mean, of course, whenever you write a book, you're making choices. And those choices are, gonna, are, 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 in a sense, evidence of bias. Everyone would have that. You can't do justice to, particularly, I've got 150 years of history here. But um, I think I don't make any explicit arguments until the very end of the book. And those have to do with the future of uh, American Jewry. So I say at the end of the book, and I don't know if we're going to get to that, but I say you can support absolutely everything Israel's ever done if you want, but you still have this problem vis-a-vis American Jewry. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, a lot of people who, uh, who read this book, who consider themselves to be pro-Israel, they'll, they'll be pained by some of it, but I think they'll recognize that, that uh, anything that's in there is footnoted and is, is to a solid source. And, um, and a lot of it goes up against the myth that has been explicitly created by the Israelis and their supporters of the United States. So that's part of what being a historian is. It's, it's myth busting. Okay, a myth busting. There you are. Because again and again, we do hear that a mythology was created um, and not just by the state of Israel and its politicians, um, but also by pro-Israel activists, big organizations like APAC here. Um, and I, I, when, when you're myth busting, I, I think you're sort of saying they weren't being accurate or early in the book. Early in the book, you say, okay, Israel is overwhelmingly popular in the United States, but that's mm-hmm. not fully explained by, by facts. You know, the, or, 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 no, I know how you put it. Israel gets so much military aid, so much indulgence from the U.S., voting with Israel in, in the U.N. and vetoing anti-Israel resolutions. And you say, so what you're, there's more to it than just strategy. There's more to it than even the natural affection with the land of the Bible. I mean, there could be very legitimate reasons that the U.S. supports Israel, and then there'll be a succession of policies, incidents, wars, threatened annexation of the West Bank, where the U.S. government has to take a stand. So you're giving us a history of it, but I I don't know if you're suggesting that the U.S. and Jews should distance themselves from Israel, just take a you know, an American-centric decision. Well, you know, I wrote a piece in Haaretz right when the book came out about, it was was about what I was talking about a minute ago, which is the history of Israeli Jewish contempt for diaspora Jews, particularly in America is most of the diaspora. Um, And they headlined it, it's time for American Jews to distance themselves from Israel. This was before the recent election. Mm. Mm-hmm. And um, and I got really upset, actually, and I sort of screwed up my relations with her arts because I said, I am not saying that. I am not telling people what to do. I am saying, here's the evidence of what has taken place. Now, um, with, uh, with the examples that, that you use, yes, there has been most definitely, very specifically and intentionally, a series of myths created by lots of people, by the Israeli government, by Leon Uris and Otto Preminger, by APAC, by neoconservatives writing in the media. And people who tried to pierce those uh, myths were frequently demonized by these very same people. And I, I, I spent a lot of time on that. APAC, uh, APAC has consistently uh, tried to destroy the careers of people who criticize Israel in ways that APAC doesn't feel comfortable with. And what's funny about that is that those those the comfort zone keeps changing and changing and changing. So Jimmy Carter caught hell for saying the words Palestinian homeland from American Jewish leaders. Nobody has a problem with anybody saying that now. You can say there should be a Palestinian homeland. APAC we even say that now. They just say, well, we can't have it today, and we can't ever imagine it actually ever happening. But it's a good idea. Um, and uh, I'll give you a for instance. When I, I mean, I grew up on this stuff, and I and I and I believed it. Um, there's been talk throughout history, and I can, I can give you lots of examples, I quote some in the book, of the radio broadcasts in 1948 that told Arabs, uh, Palestinian Arabs to leave during the war 
and that they would be welcome back as soon as the five Arab nations that invaded Israel, well, when Ben Gurion declared Israel, um, as soon as as soon as the Jews were defeated and and wiped out, and then everything would go back to normal. Um, and so Israel was held to be innocent of the fact that the that uh, seventy five percent of the Arabs or more uh, left, but there were no. There's no record anywhere of radio broadcasts. This is a, this was a complete fiction made up by the Israelis and their supporters, and and it was testified to under oath in Congress. Um, and yet it's completely made up. Um, in fact, I found a and, document, and, and we all heard it at Hebrew school uh, in our childhood right. in the U.S. I, I found a document even before the war began, where the the uh, Israeli military took credit for uh, expelling seven hundred thousand. Arabs. They may have been exaggerating, but that's about how many were expelled. 750, 750,000. Um, you know, and then and then again today, if you if you if you talk to someone who is on the quote unquote pro-Israel side or someone at APEC, they will say the Israelis wanted to live in peace and the Arabs didn't want to, and they still don't want to, and that's the problem. Well, David Ben Gurion wrote a letter to his son in 1937 saying, We're going to have to expel the Arabs. Now it's complicated what actually happened. Some were expelled, some weren't. Um, the historian, the Israeli new historians, were the first people to explain that uh, how the process worked, um, and and uh, we don't really have closure on that because the documentation is still not good. But uh, if it was a war, and a lot of terrible things happened in the war. Um, but the fact is, is that this sort of uh, mythical Israel that always wanted to live in peace and never could. And, always was on the side of, of the angels, was really believed by and, and, and fought for by Israeli partisans. And it's only recently where the, the uh, story is, is set to have two or more sides. And that's, and that's actually one, because there are now at least two sides, uh, the issue, every single thing you say becomes contested. So again- uh, Well, well, well Eric, I mean, as you said earlier, this kind of discussion does not tend to persuade anybody if they believe A, B, right. or C, or they've read some articles that hardly any Arabs were expelled and others say that many, many were, and there were massacres maybe by both sides in the 1948 to 49 war. See, I'm almost being drawn into it as well. But I know that's not your point. I believe your point in the context of we are not one is that there was a lot of mythology that made Israel always look good and angelic. But how far are you going here? Even by the time I get to the second half of your book, um, am, I, am I going to find that Israel's often the bad guy and the evil one in the Middle East conflicts? I mean, how far are you going? Well, you know, I did a conversation with my friend Peter Beinart the other day and he 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 went further than I would go, and I had to pull back from what the things he was saying mm -hmm. because he was talking about what happened in the past weeks as being built in baked in into nineteen forty eight and I wouldn't say that. There are two quotes uh, that I usually use um, when I talk about the creation of the state of Israel. One is from uh, someone I admired, two people I admire actually. one is almost Oz who said it was like we were jumping, Jews were jumping out of a burning building and we landed on the Palestinians. And the other one is from Edward Said, Palestinian, who said, we are the victims of the victims. So if you look at it in the context of 1948 and you say there were, first of all, there were 250,000 refugees from the Holocaust who no country would take them. They were still living under conditions, not all that, dissimilar from how they lived under Nazis, except that they weren't being killed. And they needed a place to go. And Palestine was the only place they could go. The United States certainly was not going to take them, and neither would, was any other country. And that's actually- and, and, ob and, and obviously you're aware of the historical connection between that land and the Jewish people, of course. Right. I mean, there have been a Zionist movement upbuilding the land uh, for a long time before that. So um, I think there had to be a state of Israel. If the, if the Arabs had said, and the British had said, come on over, it's cool. Then you wouldn't have needed a state. But you, and in fact, it was quite late in the process where the Zionists themselves felt they needed a state. They, they, were, they were talking about a commonwealth or other arrangements that, where they would share the land, some of them, anyway. Um, but I would say since then, the, you know, one of the things I, I learned writing this book that was Israel pre-67 
was a much nastier place for Arabs than I understood. Uh, number one, most the vast majority of the Arabs were expelled, not unvoluntary. Number two, uh, the Israelis, uh, after they expelled them, they passed a law in 1950 taking away all their property, say, uh, saying if you if you were an absentee property law. So the state the state um, expropriated all the property of the Arabs who had been expelled, and they wouldn't. They were not, they were not, Israel took no responsibility whatsoever for the refugees uh, that they had created. So I, I think that's really problematic uh, in terms of how uh, the Israeli Jews treated the Palestinians. Now, the way to make sense of it, the way to defend it is to look at the situation that created the state of Israel and say, look at Jewish history, look at how badly Jews have been treated, not just in the Holocaust, but they never had a chance to feel uh, secure. They needed a place to defend themselves. And this is how they were going to do it. And they didn't feel like they had the luxury of being nice to the people who, who were there. They, they said, it's, it's other people's problems, not ours. We're in this desperate situation. We have to build the state. So yeah, if, you, if you're just looking on a one-to-one -one basis, I would say the Israelis have treated the Palestinians terribly. And, Eric, uh, Eric, Eric, you still another factor you didn't mention. What's that? how were Jews and their property treated in many of the Arab countries? So what about what about you accusing me of what about ism? I absolutely am. Nothing to uh -huh. do with this. Nothing to do with how Israel treated. You, I mean, you're right. That is true. But it, it has nothing to do with how Israel treated the Arab, the, the individuals who were been living there. So so. Uh, Oh, and the other thing I learned about Israel that I didn't know pre-67 uh, was the fact that the, until 1966, all the Arabs lived under martial law. They, they couldn't go from village to village to visit their relatives and their friends without mm -hmm. the permission of the military. So I, I do think that, uh, that the inequality between Arabs and Jews uh, was baked in in such a way that um, it was definitely, it, first of all, it's unfair. And difficult to defend morally. But second of all, it was always going to create problems over time. If you can't ask people to live that way. Ah, but all but back to the main themes, as I understand it, of your book, We Are Not One, considering that it's how Americans debated Israel, felt about Israel, whether it's American Jews, their organizations, APAC, American politicians. You write in the book again and again, American politicians who might have brought up some of the criticisms that you've just been mentioning that would be swatted down right away. You would only lose votes. You would only lose your nomination for your congressional seat. Um, so those things could not be talked about. So that is part of the history you've written. Yeah, the, the, the demonization of Israel's critics is a very important part of this story. You know, interestingly, I don't spend a lot of time on this, but the American Jewish Committee, which was non-Zionist, was not terribly supportive of the idea of the state of Israel. For a while, they were really interested in in human rights violations towards uh, the Palestinian Arabs after the state of Israel. And then they eventually gave up. And I tell the story of, the, 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 there's a group of uh, mostly rabbis, but not all rabbis, called Brera, who in the early 70s, Brera is Hebrew meaning uh, choice. And, and they became very critical of the way the Israeli government was behaving and critical of American Jewish organizations for, um, enabling it and supporting it. And they, and they tried, and they went public with their criticism. And originally people were saying, well, this is interesting. This is something new, let's listen to them. Um, they made a big mistake where some of their members met with the PLO at a time when the Israelis and Americans were refusing to speak to PLO and that was used basically to demonstrate them. The interesting thing about Brev Ra though, is that one of the chairman of the board, I believe, uh, of Brev Ra was a rabbi named Arnold Jacob Wolf. And he disappeared to become a con congregational rabbi in Hyde Park, New York, Hyde Park, Chicago. And uh, in the, in the uh, 1990s, I guess, uh, a couple, a black couple moved in across the street from this synagogue named Barack and Michelle Obama. And that's who Barack Obama learned about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from, from this founder of Brea Ra. And, and it's so funny because Barack Obama went to Temple Emmanuel in, in New York, I believe it was Emmanuel. And he said, I'm basically a liberal Jew. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And, and what he meant was, I'm a liberal Jew in the tradition of the guys who founded Brera in the 1970s, which is one mm. reason that conservative Jews really hated Barack Obama, because he looked at the conflict the way liberal Jews did. Mm. By the way, a lot of people have asked me to ask you, how do you explain that Orthodox Jews in the U.S. overwhelmingly do support what Israel's doing, including, and we'll get into some more detail, what the Netanyahu government is doing right now with the judicial reform it's trying to push through the Knesset, um, whereas what you call secular Jews, I mean, most, I guess, most reformed conservative or people who don't go to synagogue at all but are interested, um, you know, take the liberal side. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the future of, of, of Palestinians and whether there should be a Palestinian state. Uh, why Orthodox Jews you know, only taking a hardline view on those issues? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it is, I'm glad you asked me that because my, what I said earlier requires some caveats. American Jews hardly ever go to synagogue. Uh, only 20% only, um, of American Jews attend synagogue regularly, as opposed to three days a year. And half of those are Orthodox. So most American Jews are not religious, but in terms of their daily lives, um, only 10% of secular Jews are. And then there's the 10% of all American Jews who are Orthodox, who basically see the world the way the Israelis do. Now, I'll be honest, I don't do justice to the Orthodox Jewish world in this book, except to say that they basically see that they're the same red country that the Israeli Jews are. Mm. Every time I say American Jews versus Israeli Jews, I have to carve out a space for the Orthodox Jews and say, except for the Orthodox. And that's going to become more and more important over time because, um, and we can get to this later if you want, secular American Jewry is in terrible shape. It's in a crisis. 33% uh, of the conservative movement has disappeared in just about the past 15 years. 20% of the reform movement has, and it would be higher if they weren't getting some conservatives, whereas the Orthodox are growing enormously. So I read a statistic that 40% of Jewish babies born in New York are Orthodox Jews, or, or the children of Orthodox Jews. Same in Israel, too. The, the enormous uh, fertility rate, I guess is the way you put it, 6.6 .6 kids on average compared to fewer than three for uh, non-Orthodox. So that's mm -hmm. actually going to be very important over time. But right now, the Orthodox are not terribly involved in national politics in the United States. They, they care much more about their own local issues, like the yeshivas and the brises and so forth. And they're not really a factor in American politics. They, they, may, they probably will be in the next 20 years, let's say, but today they don't matter much. Sure, and they very much applaud, um, well, almost entirely Republican members of Congress and Donald Trump and most of his officials who dealt with Israel, right, that's where you have evangelical Christians and Orthodox Jews who really enjoyed the Trump period because when Trump and his team looked at a lot of the issues that you've mentioned in the last 15 minutes, they didn't care. They took Israel's side. It's Israel's decision whether to let anybody live in the West Bank, whether it's Jews or Palestinians, et cetera. Um, and so you know, it, it's like the United States went through an experience for four years of a president and administration who just agreed with everything that had to do with Israel. And at least the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, thought maybe we'll get a sort of a peace deal out of that. And along the way, they also don't forget persuaded some of the Arab countries like the United Arab Emirates to sign up for the Abraham Accords and recognize Israel and have embassies and trade and investments. And so Israel is feeling more accepted than ever. That's another difference between Israeli Jews and American Jews. Israel wanted to be accepted in the region. And so without focusing on solving the Palestinian problem that you've spoken about so much, Israel, many Israelis are really happy to have been accepted by the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco and maybe other countries still to come. Yeah, you said a lot there. Um, and I don't disagree with most of it. I disagree with a little bit of it. Uh, first of all, these peace agreements were made with countries that, with whom Israel was never at war. Um, so the the it's true. Look, I'm no I'm no fan of the uh, Arab autocracies. Okay, they don't care about the Palestinians. Yeah. They never have. Um, uh, they use the Palestinians as pawns um, in order to uh, to keep their power and keep their to keep their uh, 
their population angry at someone other than the regimes. And, uh, and, and when the Palestinians became less important to them than the threat from Iran, they are happy to make a deal, you know, with the devil that they used to, the, the people they used to call the devil, which is Israel. Um, yeah, well, uh, again, uh, I'm saying the U.S. for four years had an administration that was just pro-Israel. They no had an administration what? run by an anti-Semite. Donald Trump is an anti-Semite. Mm. And he's on the record saying lots of anti-Semitic things. The leaders of the Christian evangelicals are on the record saying lots of anti-Semitic things. The largest pro-Israel organization in the world is Citizens United for Israel, run by Pastor John Hagee, who uh, introduced Nikki Haley recently at her speech and was together with Donald Trump uh, when, they, uh, when they moved the embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, Pastor Hagee said that Hitler was a hunter sent by God to bring the Jews to to bring the Jews back to Israel, um, and and he's sorry if Jews don't like that. The theology behind the uh, Christian evangelical movement, I, I think, is nuts. But it doesn't matter what I think. But it 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 the the role that Jews play in it is to bring on the rapture whereby the Jews will all go to hell unless they convert to uh, Christianity at the last minute. And, uh, and, it, and it's consistent with a lot of uh, uh, anti-Jewish attitudes that are voiced by these leaders, Hagee, Jerry Falwell, others, they're quoted in the book. And uh, conservative American Jews and Jewish organizations said to themselves, well, we don't really care what they think about Jews or what their theology is. We just care if they support Israel, and they do. So they made this deal in the 1980s, really, is when it began. Um, and now, and now we're, we've got a president who invites, an ex-president who invites uh, terrible anti-Semites to dinner and, and, and uplifts them and, and, uh, and they've become really dangerous part of this movement and we have uh, Trump supporters attacking synagogues and so forth and anti-Semitism on the, on the far right uh, has become a, a terrible threat uh, in a way that I, I never imagined it would, I didn't, I didn't see it coming. And, and so even though we even though we have a now, if you will, more conventional president in his foreign policy, that would be Joe Biden, longtime mm -hmm. Democrat, supporter of Israel, but does not want Israel's uh, Israel to keep building settlements in the West Bank and wants to keep the uh, window open for a Palestinian state, a two state solution. Um, how does how does that affect the debate that you write about in the history that we went through four years where you, okay, Christian evangelicals were in the driver's seat, perhaps. Anti-Semites, as you put it. But now well, we're back on a conventional course. That Christian helped. evangelicals and, and Sheldon Adelson and his friends. It was Sheldon Adelson who paid for, he bought, the, he, 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 he bought the building where the old embassy used to be so that it could never be converted back into an embassy. He gave more money, Sheldon Adelson gave more money to the Republican Party than any other person in the world. Okay, um, so anyway. highly politically conservative American Jews, yes. and I got you. What's, so we went through that for four years, and now we're on a more conventional course with some clashes over settlement well, policy. Well, actually, yeah, because here's, here's what's changed. The attitudes, interestingly, Trump was always saying, you Jews, what's the matter with you? Why aren't you more loyal to Israel? I mean, you're, you're disgraceful. The attitude of Jews didn't change, but the attitudes of Jewish organizations, particularly APAC, did change. So APAC, in the 2022 election, endorsed 108 Republican candidates who supported the insurrection and denied the, it, it embraced the big lie that Trump didn't lose that election. And this was a position at odds with the vast majority of American Jews who didn't vote for Trump and are, are I would say, are pretty upset with um, the idea that the United States should ignore its uh, democratic uh, laws. Now, here's what's here's an important underlying factor in this debate that explains a lot. The right wing, the quote unquote pro-Israel side, they really care. They are there day in, day out. They are actually, APAC in particular, but not only APAC, are actually writing the legislation that Congress is voting upon. Okay. Whereas the left side, the liberal side, they care about a lot of things. They care about uh, abortion, uh, women's choice. They care about inequality. 
They care, they care about uh, global warming. So they're not there all the time. They're, they're there for a day or two when they get upset about something and then they go to the next, on to the next. But the right sticks around. The, the, the comparison I use, uh, these groups don't like it, but I think it holds up is with the National Riflery Association. And it actually, it speaks to the very first point you made in our talk. Yes, Americans are more supportive of Israel than any other democracy is. Amer Amer the American people are. Just like American people like guns a lot more than any other country does. But they don't like guns as much as our political system like guns. 92% of the American people would like stricter gun control laws than we have. And American uh, people don't like Israel as much as the American government does. They don't, they like Israel, but if you told them, is it cool with you that Israel gets more military aid than any other country in the world, and it's the only country in the world that doesn't have to account for how it uses it? They would say, that's weird. We give more money than any other country, and we don't ask for any receipts, whereas every other country in the world has to give us receipts. And pardon me, do you, do, you, pardon me, do you reject the experts who say that almost all the military aid has to be spent in the United States? Well, uh, yeah, I think that, 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 I think your criticism was too broad. Well, no, because uh, the, the, the policy of giving them so many different kinds of grants, they don't end up paying for a lot of that aid. Uh, it's true that supposedly they got to buy the aid from our, uh, our defense contractors, but the mm -hmm. terms end up being so generous from Congress that it's really taken care of in terms of loans and so forth. And also, I, 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 you're telling me that they strengthen our military industrial complex to give the, those weapons makers and their, and their lobbyists and the Pentagon. I mean, as you know, trying powers. them out in the field. I'm not yes, so crazy all... about that argument. Well, I understand you're not in favor, but uh, those who care about defense and defense spending know that Israel is a country that actually then improves the technology, informs the U.S. about it, tries these things in the field, actually bombs places in Syria, reports back on what works and what doesn't. Yeah, work. You know. that's all true. That's all true. But that's not that's not the argument they make. And that's not that, uh, you know, that, that's not the argument that's made to the public. This is all part of what I'm saying. This argument is, is subterranean, okay? This is how Israel gets what it wants in Congress and from the DOD and in, in the various agencies, but it's not where the public is. The public okay. is saying broadly, yeah, actually, and, I'm, I, and, and what I'm saying now is a little bit dated because it, it's long been true that Israel was quite popular, much more so than the Palestinians. Today, you have to be careful with how you say this. Israel's definitely 100% popular with Republicans and Christian conservatives. Bibi Netanyahu, had he been born in the United States when his father was a professor here, uh, he could be the Republican nominee for president. With Democrats, it's now about 50-50. And with young Democrats, the Palestinians are more popular than the Israelis. So that, that's an important transformation. It's, it's hard to know exactly how that will affect US policy in the future because again, these legacy organizations, particularly APEC, are so powerful. I mean, more, more Jews definitely agreed with the position that J Street took in the 2022 elections than the one that APAC took. But APAC was so much more powerful and so much more funded and therefore so much more influential that it didn't matter. Eric, before we turn to uh, questions from people who are watching and they have typed them into the chat, uh, I'd like to know from you, what's What's your goal? I mean, I got it. You're, you're a historian and you took us through and I said you held our hand through the debate for decades. That, thus, we have this wonderfully clear book, We Are Not One. But is your goal that the U.S. and Israel do have a tighter alliance or that American Jews have a more Jewish life or you have some, something else? But what, what interests you the most as the outcome of all this? Well, I'm going to dodge part of that question. First of all, my goal is to, I had two goals when I started the book a long time ago, which was to get this out of my system and provide some clarity for the debate itself. Um, in terms of policy, I basically see the situation between the is Israel and the Palestinians as hopeless. Mm. Um, I have no, I have nothing optimistic to say about it. And therefore, I'm not making any recommendations. I have an awful lot, as you know, I have an awful lot of criticisms of the Palestinians and how they conduct politics. And I don't see uh, any hope for, uh, for any kind of uh, solution to this problem. Really, right now, I don't, I don't see it ever. Something has, something has to fundamentally change. 
Mm-hmm. And therefore, if you say, what would I like to see happen? Well, there's certain things that I don't imagine can happen. I would like to see happen. But again, I think I'm, I think, I think 95% of this book is written by a historian who doesn't need to have a view of what Israel should do or the Palestinians should do. Mm-hmm. There's 5% of this book that says, you know, I understand why in 1948, Americans were, American Jews were so eager to embrace Zionism and it made sense. And I probably would have done it too, uh, had I been alive back then. And it was good for American Jews who were feeling horrible about their powerlessness and the Holocaust and shamed by the history of the diaspora and thrilled by the heroic story that they understood to be taking place. And in fact, was taking place in many respects in Palestine. But that since then, American Jews, uh, secular American Jews, not the Orthodox, have allowed their Judaism, their Jewish identities to be basically hollowed out by support for Israel and the sacralization of the Holocaust. Lately, they've thrown in a lot of anti-Semitism concerns uh, just in the past few years. But since 67, the organizations that used to do tikkun olam, that used to do Jewish education, that used to do community outreach, that used to um, do uh, social justice have basically only done Israel. And it worked on me. Uh, it worked maybe on a generation after me, but it doesn't work anymore. Israel is not that attractive to young people anymore. And the Holocaust was a much longer time ago than it was when I was young. And, uh, and there have been a lot of other kinds of atrocities that make it seem less unique. I still think it's quite unique, but I guess they're all unique. Um, and so American Jewry, as I said earlier, is in a crisis. And I think that there are a lot of reasons for this crisis, but a big one is telling, is telling Jews, as I was told, to be a Jew means to support Israel and remember the Holocaust um, and to go to a Seder. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's one reason why um, secular American Jewry is disappearing. So what I would like to see yeah. is a lot of the investment that's gone towards Israel, like say in birthright, to go towards American Jewish institutions to rejuvenate the notion of what it means to be an American Jew or a diaspora Jew anywhere, but particularly in America, where I think 80% of the diaspora can be found. Because without it, it's going to shrink to almost nothing. There's your concern. In fact, it's time to turn to Suzanne Borden of Moment Magazine, who I know has been looking at the questions that people are typing in. Hi, Suzanne. There must be some questions for Eric Alterman. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you both for that great conversation. Um, Somebody wanted to know at the beginning if you uh, could say more about what is Zionist anti-Semitism. Oh, well, Zionist anti-Semitism is this uh, very common Israeli belief that the uh, diaspora should disappear that there was something shameful about Jewish life in the diaspora historically, that the diaspora Jews who had lived uh, under the foot of so many different regimes were in part responsible for their own oppression. And that Israel in creating this new brave uh, fighting militant Jew was showing diaspora Jews how to live. That this was the solution to the Jewish problem throughout history. And those Jews who chose to remain in diaspora would either disappear through assimilation or disappear through anti-Semitism. And it, 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 was, it, was, it was a lack of self-respect that kept them there. And, uh, and this, has, this has been a consistent theme of Israeli uh, history. You can find some terrible quotes from the beginning of Israel. You can find them today. And I, and I, and, and, and I, and I accuse, I don't accuse, I demonstrate that Michael Oren in his book, he, he plays to that too. But you, you have, I mean, if you see the way that uh, that uh, religious Israeli uh, ministers uh, and rabbis talk about reform Jews. Uh, they call them dogs, they call them pigs. They say that they're not Jewish. And reform is the largest uh, denomination among American Jews. There's, there's definitely a very strong um, uh, streak of this. And it's, you can find that on both the left and the right, but it, I guess it's more prevalent on the right. Thank you. Um, I do want to say a a comment that has come up uh, multiple times today um, is 
uh, people have commented that uh, the use of calling Jews that are not part of the Orthodox community um, secular um, seems to be offensive to a lot of people. Um, oh, and, well, I call myself a secular American Jew. So, so I just um, wanted to read that. I just wanted to yeah. note that, that, that quite I've never a few... heard that. It's interesting that you say that because I've never heard anyone say that before. I, I, yeah. It's supposed to, it's secular in the sense that they live in a secular world as opposed to the uh, live their lives oh. in a world of yeshivas and so on. Interesting. So I, I think maybe um, what you mean by secular and what other people are hearing, what they describe as secular, maybe two different things. Um, let me help. Let me help, Eric, but also clarify, if I may, uh, as a non-Orthodox, but I think active Jew, um, secular by that. Eric, you didn't mean uneducated, stupid, no way they speak Hebrew or know the prayers. Uh, right. No insult. No, not at all. Yeah. I would say modern Orthodox Jews. I would call them secular Jews. Oh, <laughs> because they live in they 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 live in they, they go to they go to universities they live in the they live in the secular world that's what i mean mm -hmm. uh, do you feel it's too late for a two-state solution why or why not yes i do um and that's why i've i've sort of given up on 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 agitating in this space and and moved much more towards my concerns about the future of american jewry i mm -hmm. think that the uh israeli public well, what happened was Israel was always divided about whether or not it was willing to give up land for peace. It was never, there was never a consensus on this point. Um, and it was never tested. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and it was somewhat tested during the Oslo peace process. Um, I was actually on the White House lawn that day and I cried. I was so moved by Rabin's speech. And I thought he was speaking for thousands of years of Jewish history. He was magnificent, um, but it wasn't real. The, the concessions weren't ready to be made. And when things started to go to hell, uh, everybody pulled back into their original self-protective positions. And during the second intifada, when, uh, when the terrorism returned uh, to the Palestinian struggle and, and they reacted and, and did some horrible things, but everyone always refers to the pizza parlor massacre and also um, the, there was this uh, Drew soldier, it was a Jew actually, it's weird, but he was ripped apart by a Palestinian mob and this was shown. Um, basically the Israelis just gave up on ever having peace with the Palestinians. They built this wall that protected them from the vast majority of terrorist incidents and they lived just fine this way. Uh, and so uh, they're not, the, and, and then you have the Palestinian public uh, going on the one side towards Hamas. You can't make peace with Hamas, I agree with that. And, and the Palestinian Authority, which is anti-democratic and corrupt and, and lacking in, in, um, in legitimacy on the part of its own people. So the Israelis are telling the truth when they say we have no one to make peace with. The Palestinians could say the same thing. Um, but the fact is, is that the right wing in Israel has used this period to create the conditions whereby it's almost impossible to imagine how you could have a peace, offer the Palestinians a peace that they could ever accept. They've been create what 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 the peace that would be offered by Israel is a piece of, of Bantu stands with Palestinian disconnected Palestinian lands that would not have any uh, economic um, independence, and the Palestinians are not going to accept that. Now we haven't really talked much about the Palestinians in the conversation. There's a lot more to say about that. But my point is, is that uh, the Israelis, even in the last five elections, there was almost no talk of making peace by any of the parties, and certainly none of the major parties, um, because it's just not an issue for the Israelis anymore. And during that period, um, they've created the conditions that have made uh, peace uh, very hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. And I'll just be a bit more optimistic if I can with changes in leadership over the years, maybe the decades to come. I think the Middle East is very dynamic. There could be more to gain and more to lose for the Palestinian public in the West Bank. I don't know who their leader is going to be after Abu Mazen. Even Hamas might want to actually establish a state that it can run. You never know. And money poured in from Saudi Arabia, et cetera, could change the picture. So I, I, have, I have more hope than you, Eric, but I know that's not saying much. Well, one thing I would say, and again, with regard to the Palestinians, um, there are a lot of different Palestinian constituencies. I, I've been in, uh, you must have too, Dan. I was once inside a Palestinian refugee camp by myself. My wife was threatened actually. 
I've never been in a worse place in my life. I've never seen such hopelessness. Um, no, no, uh, you know, uh, there were no toilets. There were no, there were no clothes without holes in them. There was no schooling. There were no doctors. Um, so that's, that's one constituency. And then there's the people living under occupation, something that Israelis don't, a phrase is, Israelis are loath even to use anymore. Then there are the Palestinian Israelis. Then there's the Palestinian diaspora working in the Arab world in the Gulf and so forth. Then there's, I don't know how many, but there's quite a few Palestinians living very nice lives, you know, professors and doctors and lawyers also in the diaspora. How can you satisfy all these constituencies simultaneously? Particularly when you have Saudi Arabia and Egypt and other Arab countries saying, we have a stake in this too. So when Barack, uh, and Clinton offered Ar Arafat a deal in 2000. I don't think it was a very good deal. It wasn't nearly as good a deal as people act like it was. And and the Israeli, a number of Israeli negotiators said, said if I were Palestinians, I wouldn't have taken this deal. But I think they should have taken the deal because I think something is better than nothing and you can build on it. Um, that's not a popular view among on the left. But I, I think that. Anyway, uh, the Egyptians and the Saudis said to Arafat, you're not taking this deal. We didn't get enough from Jerusalem. We need all of Jerusalem, or we need all of Arab Jerusalem, or no deal. And, and they said, you better not take this because you'll be in a lot of trouble. Uh, so how can you satisfy all these constituencies at once except by saying no, right? No works. And, and that's another reason that I'm very pessimistic about the future of peace. Mm -hmm. um, do Israelis in power care about American opinion? I mean, does Israel still need uh, American Jews. And uh, along with that, can more liberal Jewish Americans have an economic influence or pressure on the current hardline poli Isra Israeli policy? Um, there are some Israeli Jews who do care about American Jewish opinion, but they're fewer and fewer. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu and his supporters do not care. And they, they say so. They say, we have the Christians. Uh, we don't care about you whining Jews. Um, They've never cared that much. It's, it's always been kind of a myth that they cared at all. When a bunch of, um, Golda Meir, and, uh, when she was prime minister and Yitzhak Rabin was the ambassador to the United States, uh, American rabbis and, and Jewish leaders met with, with them and said, stop being so nice to Nixon. That Rabin basically told American Jews to vote for Nixon over McGovern. And, and Golda Meir said, where are your phantom jets? You know, same thing that Stalin's famous, famous for saying, how many troops does the Pope? Now, today, uh, the Netanyahu and the conservative Israelis are, are very much in sync with the Republican Party and, and, uh, and uh, conservative Christians and their supporters and that, that part of American Jewry that supports them. And they don't really see a problem. They're, when the Iron Dome, when, when Congress voted whether or not to give Israel an extra billion dollars on top of the $38 billion it was already giving them that Barack Obama had agreed to under the memo of understanding. The vote was 538 to eight with one abstention, AOC. Um, so that's not something they need to worry about. I mean, 528 to eight, one abstention. Now, I spoke, uh, I gave a talk at Tel Aviv University in uh, the end of May and someone raised their hand and said, let's say I'm an Israeli and I like Trump and I'm like all the other Israelis, what do I care? what you American Jews think. And I, and I gave two answers. I'm not sure they care, but if I were looking at what they should care about, here's what I would say. Here's what I did say. One is, is that if you lose American Jews, you really are alone in the world. We're, we're, half, we're just about half the Jews in the world. Israel and America are 80% of the world's Jews. So if you lose us, you're always worried about feeling alone in the world. It's not been true. You've had us. You won't have us. It's very different to be existentially alone than not. And second, um, people who go to college, who've gone to college for the past 10 years. I, I used to be friends a long time ago with Tony Blinken. I still know him a little bit. And, and he and I went to college uh, at a time, we're the same age. He and I went to college at a time when the Israeli narrative was the narrative that one learned in college. But today you don't learn that narrative. It's much closer, the Palestinian narrative is much stronger in college. So the future Tony Blinkens uh, and the future people who are not as, as important as Tony is, but who are peopling the congressional staffs and the, and, the, and, the, and the think tanks and so forth, they will have been educated about a very different kind of Israel. And if Israel continues to show contempt for uh, American Jewish opinion, then 
the, the kind of things that Israel's always depended on, again, that are under the surface of headlines, that won't be there anymore. So those are the two reasons I give. But by and large, I think that the right has a pretty strong hold on uh, our politics vis-a-vis -vis Israel, Palestine, no matter what the rest of the country, no matter what people actually think, because they're the ones who care, just like the gun people, they're the ones that care. And yet, by the way, I think the Netanyahu government uh, made a mistake. I especially mean in 2015 when he came to Washington, gave that speech to Congress where only the Republicans invited him, clearly was speaking strongly against something that President Obama thought was the right thing to do, to have a nuclear deal with Iran. Um, and uh, that, for me, is the watershed in 2015 that Republicans and the political right in the U.S. say they love Israel, they'll agree with everything Israel does, and the left doesn't feel that way, very divided. And I think that will damage um, the support that Israel has enjoyed in the U.S., including eventually votes on foreign aid. Could be. I mean, and, do, and, and do you think uh, that in the future we could have a president that does not support Israel? No, but the level of support you're getting from Democrat Joe Biden is probably the high point of uh, future Democratic support. In 2020, both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders wanted to condition aid to Israel on how it treated the Palestinians. Joe Biden said, that's crazy. Um, I can't believe that they mean that, but they meant it. And so will future Democratic candidates and likely Democratic presidents. Um, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders both refused to speak at APAC because of the position that APAC took. Um, so Biden is really part of the past. And I think everybody gets that. He's, he's part of the past. He's part of the, He's got all these deep personal connections to Israelis. They're, they're not the Israelis that are in power now, particularly, but they're, but they're in his heart. It's kind of like Harry Truman. He just, he just really cares about them. Um, and he's, and he's, and his foreign policy is in the tradition of Harry Truman. But I think the rest of the party has moved on. And as I said, the Democratic Party has, is moving. Right now it's split 50-50 but it's moving in the direction of the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So the political system, I think, will still be on the side of the Israelis, but the presidency under Democrats will, will be much tougher on the Israelis and will demand, uh, I think, better treatment for the Palestinians, if only to satisfy their constituencies. Uh, and uh, it may not be meaningful, it may be for show. Um, Biden has not gone very far you know, he, has, he's, he hasn't opened up the consulate for the Palestinians, even though he promised to in the, in his, uh, in the Democratic um, platform. But the Israelis said, don't do it. And, and he hasn't done it. Um, he's been loath to have a conflict, an open conflict with the Palestinians, with the Israelis. It looks like the new government's going to force one. But Biden is trying very hard to avoid it. And I'm not sure that will be the case in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And as we wrap up, um, so what role should Israel play within the American Jewish community? And what, what advice do you have um, to, to people trying to navigate this? Um, well, again, you know, I don't, I don't think Israel should have any role in the American Jewish community per se. I think if, if people want to support Israel, uh, that's great. That's fine. Uh, I'm not telling them what to think or feel, um, but Israel is a different country than the United States, and American Jewry is in crisis. Now, there, there are many people who say, if you want to be a good American Jew, you have to support Israel, period. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to keep kosher. You don't have to marry a Jew. You don't have to raise your kids Jewish, but you have to support Israel. That's been the majority position uh, of American Jewish leaders, and I think that's been very damaging. Uh, to uh, to the future of American Jews and particularly to young American Jews. Um, so so yeah, I, I am saying I'm not taking a position on what Israel should do, and I'm not even taking a position on what American foreign policy should be vis-a-vis -vis Israel. But I am taking a position on the future of American Jewry, saying if you want to have a strong, vibrant future, you need to pay a lot more attention to American Jews and a lot less attention to these Jews living five thousand miles away, who by the way are doing just fine. They don't really need you. 
Great. Well, on that note, I want to thank you both for this uh, wonderful conversation. Uh, I want to remind people that you can buy Eric's book, uh, We Are Not One. I will send a link in uh, a few days to this recording for those who'd like to share it or watch it again, uh, along with a link to purchase the book. Uh, also, please go to momentmag.com where you can sign up for next week's program about Golda Meir and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Again, uh, Eric, thank you. Dan, thank you. And we'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.